Piping design is a booming industry, but one that few know much about. Time to change that. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast. This is the show where we empower you to transform industries by championing innovation. You're invited to join my mission to embrace and share the innovations transforming the AEC, MEP, and manufacturing industries. Also, please check out our website, bridgingthegappod.com, and share with your friends and coworkers while leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Plant 3D master and guru who really needs no introduction, David Wolf. All right, welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Uh, can you start by kind of just giving us a brief background uh, view and uh, how you got into plant? Sure, sure. So we started, uh, I started out of college doing piping design for an engineering firm in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, Fagan Engineering, we started doing, uh, they do, did a lot of ethanol construction. Okay. And so they do a lot of tank farm design and outside the building limits uh, design. Um, and I started as a, just a, a drafter, doing some mechanical work, mm -hmm. um, learned how to do some pump sizing, things like that. So we got into uh, doing PNIDs and takeoffs, manual takeoffs, and then um, pretty quickly got tired of doing the manual takeoffs and I started looking for ways to make it easier. Um, and through that process, I discovered what a database is because I had no clue. And the first time I heard the word database, it scared me a little bit, kind of like most people, I think. Uh -huh. They hear database and I kind of run from it. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so through that kind of discovered, uh, first of all, using AutoCAD a little bit better and attributes and then getting that stuff out of that to Excel. Um, and then really kind of that just started my whole exploration with learning about how to use software and tweak it and where does the data go and that whole desire to get better information out of your drawings and projects. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, went to another company called Performance Group there in Greenville. And um, we did a, a design on biodiesel plants. And so we worked um, on some pretty fun projects, building a couple of facilities and uh, it was funny, the first project I did, we had a bunch of designers, it was a time crunch, and um, they put like 10 designers on the project. And so you see pipe going everywhere, there's very little structure, kind of chaotic. Yeah. And then we're like, oh my word, this is just like so hard to navigate. And then the second project we did, it was me and one other guy on it, and we had like three months to get it all done. And we sat down and we had a plan, uh -huh. laid out the racks, and it was just beautiful. You could see straight through, there's no spaghetti pipe going everywhere. Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of fun learning from those guys and uh, building those projects and learning how piping works because I had no you know, ex prior experience to it then sure. for those, those times. Um, and so I really, that started me into CatWorks. Um, started me into coding as well. Like I learned how to start getting into some VBA, which uh -huh. is kind of like a beginner programming. Okay. Um, one of the first jobs they give you is usually pl printing drawings, right? And so they said, go print. So I have a stack of a hundred different drawings and we're like, okay, click, 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 click. And Sounds riveting. Yes. <laughs> so already I'm getting bored and, you know, I'm like, okay, what's next? And mm -hmm. so I uh, found ways to learn to use a publish command, which no one in my office had learned before. So I was like, ooh, this is published. Did you know you can do this? Click. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and so nice. I'm like, oh, it is a hero. Look. <laughs> wow. Rockstar Dave. <laughs> I could go home this weekend. Um, and so that was a lot of fun learning that stuff. And then they started looking at, we started looking at other things we, we can automate. So mm -hmm. we don't have to just sit there and do the same click for three hours. Nice. Um, so that's kind of my start, you know, just learning the mechanical side of things, learning the walking through the project requirements, how to put models together. Mm -hmm. um, the process, you know, I learned a lot about process there as far as, you know, when you kick a project off, you get a bunch of equipment you got to put somewhere and finding all the vendors, um, finding, you know, the structural group and getting the information for them, building that model out so you can make sure you don't run pipe into the columns. That's fairly important. Probably be pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, although there are a lot of good examples on Facebook and LinkedIn, if you want to look at pipe running through structural members, it's, it's, uh, kind of scary how often that happens. Like, it, with it cut the structural member around the pipe. And, Terrifying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Don't look behind the walls. <laughs> yes. No. no. Um, so that was, you know, getting to see um, how all that stuff goes together and building a facility or a plant. Mm -hmm. Really, really fun. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so what about piping design uh, attracted you to the industry to begin with? It was a job. 
Like, so I, you know, we had uh, graduated, I had a degree in engineering, um, just gotten married uh-huh. and uh, was looking for my first engineering job. Yeah. And uh, did some HVAC stuff, but I was too interested in software apparently. So mm-hmm. they didn't like see me as a fit. And uh, so I moved on from that. And then uh, when my contacts um, got me in at Fagan, I was like, okay, I, I'll do mechanical stuff. And F. Fagan, part of mechanical was learning piping design. Interesting. So that was kind of the, the first foray into that. And then like it turned out I had a pretty good knack for just kind of 3D space and figuring out how to solve problems geometrically and um, really enjoyed that part. Plus that was where all the cool technology was because uh-huh. the structural designers, uh, a lot of them were still like doing 2D AutoCAD drawings. Electrical stuff is all straight lines. It's a big electrical joke that we always tell, <laughs> make fun of them because they just draw straight lines everywhere. Um, but the, the piping design was really getting into the 3D stuff and and uh, it was really kind of a little more exciting about that. And so I was like, well, this, this is going to be fun. Yeah. So I got to discover some cool tools. First started using Navisworks. Um, I had a, we had discovered this. This was like a big day because before in AutoCAD, and this was AutoCAD 2006. So um, like you're driving around looking at your model and you couldn't actually like you use 2D wireframe. And so you can't visualize very well right. what it looks like because it's not rendered. You right. know, it's just a bunch of lines. And so one of our guys developed, discovered that Navisworks was something we were entitled to. And so we loaded up the model of Navisworks. And this was the first time we'd seen the entire facility loaded up in full 3D. And we're just like, that'd be life changing. Yeah. yeah. You're like, uh, oh, yeah, we're running. Why was I doing it the other way? We're running this stuff all over the place. <laughs> nice. And so I had a Piper boss and he sat down and he was showing people about it. And like it, for us at that time, it was so realistic. And for him, especially, it was so realistic that he like, he almost fell out of his chair because he like his mouth slipped one time. He <laughs> nearly <laughs> fell out. We're just like it was just awesome, you know. It was like yeah. a video game and just getting to see that stuff. It was it was a, a big day. A big oh, I day bet. in the design world. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so, what are some common challenges and um, some p- potential pitfalls of plant design? Yeah, so uh, a lot of it's around schedule. Um, so there's let's just say in a we did a 50 million gallon, gallon a year plant. It was fairly, it's a medium sized deal. Mm-hmm. Um, we had like 150 pieces of equipment that were all custom made um, inside that doesn't in- include the tanks. Um, some of those might take like a year and a half to build or to fabricate. Um, in addition, you have some valves. Sometimes there's 12 inch lines or 20 inch lines. Some of the valves are gonna take a long time. You have to order those. Mm-hmm. And so when you start your design, um, if you start from the PNIDs, some people are lucky enough to where they have the PNIDs designed up front. Um, that's another joke in the piping world because like you're supposed to have the PNDs done before you do the piping, uh, but you, they almost never get it. And so <laughs> they're like, oh, okay, let's figure out how to do this thing. Yeah. Um, and so if you do start your PNDs up front and you get them done, um, then you have a list that you can say, here's the stuff we need to order six months out, three months out. Let's go mm-hmm. purchase this. Um, and so what happens is if you're on AutoCAD based design or just non-intelligent PNDs, mm-hmm. you're going and every time you want to do that purchase list, you have to go count up every valve. You have to figure out the size, figure out where it is, see if you purchased it or not before, or, you know, yeah, like the whole process. Time consuming? Yes. Um, so that's one of the big challenges. The other part is it's um, piping ends up being kind of the, the uh, coordination point for a lot of other disciplines. So structural can build their building, right? Mm-hmm. And they do that fairly independently. Mm-hmm. Um, now they do interact with equipment, so they have to make sure they can load the equipment and support it when you drop a vessel on the second floor this would actually drop all the way through (laughs) um but they can build that without a whole lot of other other than the weight Mm -hmm. um and then likewise like the building they can put the building there put the walls and windows and doors places but then the piper is the one who bring it all together and so they're going to figure out well what elevation does this stuff need to be Mm -hmm. um do we have everything in the model and that was one of the big discussions we had early on when we're adopting this is um, what do we model? Because they're like, oh, let's just put the piping in and we'll put a box here because we know that piping goes there and then we'll call it good. Yeah. And so we did that and then we're like, okay, so it ended up we had the equipment too high and we didn't really know that because we didn't model the full pieces of equipment. Uh-huh. So, um, so then we started, okay, well, let's go ahead and model this piece of equipment full detail so that we can know if what we're putting in matches the vendor drawing. So we start right. tracking the vendor drawings. And then turns out we didn't model the concrete at all. And so guess what? That was wrong at some point. A lot of rework in the so, system. <laughs> yeah. So it turns out, you know, um, 
we just started going more and putting more and more detail in a 3D model mm -hmm. to kind of avoid all those little coordination issues that you wouldn't see without having a, a real visual representation of it. Gotcha. So I guess schedule, the coordination aspect, um, and then there's a lot of other challenges around um, just how complex moving fluid is mm. and like the materials and stuff. Mm. You know, with water, wastewater type things, generally the, the requirements aren't as stringent. And so, mm. you know, if you leak water somewhere, oh no, it's going to evaporate and you're good. Yeah. If you leak hydrochloric acid somewhere, not, not as, <laughs> not, not as good. good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and there's other liquids, you know, if they evaporate, you know, you're going to be killing people. So small That's, little details like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So those are some of the other challenges, which is when you get into that um, more exotic stuff where you got to make sure mm -hmm. you have the right procedures, that you're showing all the right procedures, that you're using the right materials, that you're giving reports to show the right material counts. Um, like some of the materials, like literally they have to fabricate every piece of pipe that you make in the shop. They, uh -huh. they build it all from hand, basically. And so if you mess that up, then that's a lot of time to, for them to go back and fix that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the big three challenges, I guess. What was that? So, uh, schedule, coordination, coordination, and complexity. Yeah. Hey, there you go. I like it. Uh, so for those who may not be as familiar with Autodesk Plan 3D, mm -hmm. what is it? So Autodesk Plan 3D is an AutoCAD based piping design platform. Okay. Um, and what is nice about it is it combines into one project, your PNIDs, which is your 2D drawing schematics mm -hmm. that lay out the process flow. And it also combines and includes a 3D model um, component. Um, and so there's a validation process. So a lot of questions come up around, well, how does this link? You know, if I delete a valve in my PNID, is it gone from my model? That type of thing. Uh -huh. And it's loosely connected. So no, that doesn't happen. So in the process of doing design, a lot of times what happens is um, a junior drafter will be the one re responsible for doing the, the 2D schematics, right? Okay. And so if you were to build a system where he could delete a valve and then it disappears out of your 3D model, mm -hmm. that's Pretty bad. <laughs> um, so PNID, AutoCAD Plant 3D handles it by making it a validation process. So if we place a valve, let's call it a hand valve 101 in the PNID. And if we place the same valve on the different line or on the right line or somewhere else in the model, mm -hmm. it can run, check through all the valves, check their tags, see if they're on the correct line, see, you know, and all that other information, mm -hmm. make sure they have the right size and spec. Um, so it's a looser connection where they're not interdependent on each other, but you do see a, a good report over what's in there and what's not in there. Interesting. Um, cool. So it handles that. They also have an isometrics component um, where it uh, will generate the isometric for people to build the pipe system off of. Uh -huh. um, and then one of the most exciting parts is probably that we've been diving deeper into is the spectrum and PNIDs. So for a long time, I was like, eh, I don't know if I like this implementation of it as much. But recently, we've done a little more investigation and the Spectrum PNIDs in the product are a lot better than I initially thought they were. Uh -huh. um, and so I've been really impressed with how flexible it is and some of the capabilities of it. So um, it's a good tool. It's uh, included as part of the AEC collection. So if you purchase the AEC collection, you get Revit, Advanced Steel, Plant 3D. Mm. Um, it's also part of the tool set. So if mm. you purchase AutoCAD, it comes as part of the tool sets that you have there. Gotcha. Um, they are separate downloads. So people are confused by that a lot of times where if you download AutoCAD, you don't automatically get Plant 3D. You have to go back and download Plant 3D separately. Uh -huh. But they're all, you're entitled to both of those. Gotcha. Um, going back to the, the spec driven part of it, yeah. what about that has won you over recently? Well, so initially I was thinking, um, like there's a lot of, like let's say in a, in a pipe spec, um, the client would say, well, we can use a ball valve by mm -hmm. this manufacturer here, or in some situations you can use a different ball valve by a different manufacturer. Uh -huh. um, well, I was under the impression that it couldn't handle those optional situations. Yeah. And it does. Oh, cool. So it makes it really easy. It all works off of the model when you're using the tools. Um, and it gives a, you can get a really, a really good report out of it and synchronize properties. Um, it's just not as well documented as it could be. Gotcha. Which was the initial confusion. Gotcha. Yeah. Documentation is important. <laughs> Turns out. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to hear some examples and some, some stories that you got on how people have used Plan 3D for greater efficiency. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of, of things. Um, so a lot of the process of using Plan 3D is tied up in the data part, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we really care about. 
Um, so with that, you can customize your project setup. And you can add properties that you that you want to report on mm -hmm. or display information about. So a lot of the efficiencies come around organizing the work processes. So like for example, um, let's say they have they want to start tracking which lines have been modeled, which lines are ISO, which lines um, they've reported or done bill materials or stress done stress analysis on. And they can create properties that allow them to select, select that and mm -hmm. put it in and they say, okay, we have 75% of our lines have gone to stress analysis. Let's say we've modeled or finished 30% you know, of the lines. So they can get more project tracking. Um, it's very flexible, so they can set up almost anything they want to. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been a lot of that around reporting, a lot of it around um, companies who are coming from some of the other platforms. Sometimes they're not as flexible or customizable, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's just harder to do. Um, so com people coming from auto plant really enjoy how simple it is mm -hmm. to do things, and there's less steps to do things, and it's more efficient that way. Um, so a lot of those efficiencies. Um, recently, we've seen a lot more gains um, around facilities management. So like the fact that we can put the project in vault and provide some sort of workflow control mm -hmm. helps them, you know, make sure that the engineers are only getting released stuff and not stuff that's work in progress. Gotcha. Um, and then also, we've also been working with some other clients around BIN 360 and what does it look like when you put that stuff in BIN 360 or what does it look like when you collaborate um, with different offices and how does that help them? And so we have some guidelines because some of the features aren't fully developed and you have to, there's mm -hmm. some gotchas there. Um, but we're seeing people adopt that. And um, we have one client that I work a lot with um, who's done some really cool stuff as far as um, their situation is a little unique because they are an owner operator. They're a natural gas company. They okay. actually do all of their own design work and then they build mm -hmm. all their own facilities. Mm -hmm. And so they have control of the process from end to end because they're the client, the builder, and the, and the designer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so his effort has been putting all the data that they can in this Plant 3D project. Uh -huh. And then they're using Fusion Lifecycle, they're using BIM360 Collaboration, they're using Build and a lot of other tools to put this plant data and then distribute it to all these other consumers like uh -huh. their maintenance group, um, their electrical group. So when they do hookups and things like that, they they have the, the plant database is just, it's the key place. And yeah, they're just putting all this data here and getting it out. It's literally the one-stop shop. Yes, yes. Oh, that's cool. So, He's done a lot of really exciting things around there and uh, he's doing doing some cool stuff with that. Yeah, well, we were talking earlier about one of the, uh, our clients that has taken Vault and mm -hmm. mixed it kind of with Plant 3D2 to, yeah. to help. Uh, can you kind of tell that story a little bit? Yeah, so uh, this was another um, owner operator. Um, and so their transition was from project wise. Um, and so really that was more around the design product because they were able to save a lot of money. Uh -huh. Um, by switching their licenses to Autodesk and then having the integrated environment with Plant 3D means that they don't have to do as much file shuffling and database movement and mm -hmm. synchronization as they were trying to do when they're running Plant 3D on top of project-wise. Um, so they save a lot of money on the licenses. In addition, the, the environment for the designers to go and design, run the pipe, build what they need to, it's a lot more streamlined. So they're they're a lot happier. Yeah. So nice. Uh, so one of the big buzzwords is collaboration. Yes. How does Plan 3D kind of break down some barriers for better collaboration? Yeah. So that's kind of a journey. Um, I know Autodesk has shared publicly that there's a beta for this, but uh, right now the current offering is for when you purchase a seat of BIM 360 design, uh -huh. you get access to BIM 360 docs and BIM 360 team, and that's a little okay. known fact even inside of Autodesk. Uh -huh. uh, so um, the current offering runs Plan 3D on top of BIM 360 team. Okay. And that allows you to work on a project and check it in. And they have a database up there invisibly in the cloud. Uh -huh. It's kind of magical. And so when you check out drawings, you're the only one who can modify them. When you check it in, your changes get published to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And a user in some other location somewhere else in the world can go check out the drawing after you're done with it or check in their own drawings and keep working. Mm -hmm. um, so it enables true work sharing globally. And nice. so that's a big deal for a lot of companies. Yeah. Um, what's exciting about some of the offerings, for example, around BIM 360 Docs that you see, BIM 360 Docs has a lot more um, permission control. And mm -hmm. so you have things like you can allow permissions based on a folder level or based uh -huh. on a role. And so you have things like people can read, write, people can read okay. only. Cool. And it's just a lot more flexible. And yeah. so 
um, it'll be exciting to see that get integrated in, in the future. Nice. Uh, so I'd love for you to describe kind of what point cloud data is and then unpack yes. the, the power behind it. Yeah, so point clouds. Um, so the process of using point clouds usually comes up because uh, all these facilities for natural and gas or refineries, they're required to know what's going on in their facility all the time, right? So uh -huh. they have to know what's built, what's there, and yep. so on. Um, in addition, there's a requirement that every X number of years, they go through and make sure that their p and mm -hmm. match what is built and what's been installed. Okay. And so a lot of times, historically, what they've done is they'd send someone out to field with this tape measure, and they go out and figure out how, how, how tall the pipe is when it turns into the rack. And yeah everything else. And so it's a lot of big manual effort. They're marking up the PNDs, drawing it. Uh -huh. um, they're figuring out the tank stuff. And you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Sure. Um, so the point cloud technology has been coming around and it's, it's pretty much mainstream now um, where they take a laser scanner, they set it in a location uh -huh. and it takes a 360 degree picture or captures points uh -huh. in the space around the equipment. Um, and so what that lets them do is that lets them, we get still get really high fidelity precise models that mm -hmm. are based on these points without having to put someone in the field all the time. And what was actually really exciting is we saw at AU, um, Faro had a robot from DARPA where they put a point cloud scanner on top of the robot and then walked him around. And so theoretically- Is this the dog? Yeah, that's that's the the dog. Dog. yeah. So theoretically what's coming in the next, who knows how many years is mm -hmm instead of having to put a person out there walking these scanners around, mm -hmm. we'll have automated paths where these robots will go out there, scan it, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll have some magical cloud thing that, that compares the changes and lets us know what's changed in the facility. Yeah. So there might not even be any human interaction at some point. Wow. Yikes. <laughs> when the robots take over the world. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that's the type of thing. So it's used for validating what's there in the field. It also gives us a leg up when we go to do uh, fix an issue or go mm -hmm. to refit some pipe. Um, we know where the existing stuff is. We know what we need to cut out. We can take measurements around it, figure out the distances we have to work things instead of having to go yeah. make sure the field actually took all the dimensions we need. Right. It keeps us all in the office, which it's a big safety deal. So like I was mentioning, you know, poisoning people and killing them with acid, that type of That's thing. Small stuff. Yeah. The more you keep someone in the office, the safer everyone is. So. <laughs> um, that's a big deal for people is being able to keep people behind the desk and solve the problems at the same mm. time. Yeah, cool. Uh, so what should people know about the reporting functionality in Plant 3D? It is probably the most underutilized feature of Plant 3D. Um, it's really powerful, but uh -huh. it is there is a learning curve. Um, but you can do pretty much anything that you would like to. Um, so it's something that we're, we've invested time in learning, and I'm a big fan of it because mm -hmm. since that first project manager asked me for the vowels by the line number and back at Fagan, that was when I started doing reporting. Yeah. And so then it, reporting used to look like, let's go manipulate this Excel spreadsheet in ways that you can't even document at all because they're really complex uh -huh. to let me just add this column here and it's done. Yeah. And so um, it's really flexible. There's really powerful tools for it. Um, and it can save them a lot of time. And it it's the way that people should be communicating between different departments about what's going on in the PNID or in the model. Mm -hmm. So. Very cool. Uh, can you uh, un unpack how engineers and, and piping designers should go about kind of gaining uh, the, the, the basic understanding of how to lay out a uh, process plant and, and run piping? Yeah, so um, typically they'll lay out some sort of process design. In some uh -huh. cases, they'll get the process from a company that does process design. They figure out what equipment they want and what fluids are going where. In some cases, they have to do that all from scratch. Mm. Um, so they get the process in, make sure it's doing what they want it to do. Um, and then they start building your equipment. And so figuring out what equipment is on the drawings that they need. They're going to source the, the models from the vendors or source the, the data sheet, cut sheets from the vendors so they mm -hmm. know what they need to model. Uh, and then they're going to create models of the equipment. And then usually at the same time, pipe specs are being developed. So pipe spec is a, a document that owner operators use to convey what pipe materials like carbon steel or stainless steel or mm -hmm. FRP are allowed to be used on their services. So just like you don't want acid to leak all over anyone, right? We have to use a special pipe to carry the acid. Mm -hmm. And so we would refer to that pipe and describe how it gets installed and everything else about it in our pipe spec so that everyone knows this is what we're gonna use. Yeah. Um, so those are a document that's 
pretty strictly controlled and that everyone has. And so you make you would need to make some version of that inside of a plant 3D or whatever piping design product you're gonna use. Mm -hmm. um, and so each of them implement it differently, but you have to have a pipe spec. Sure. Um, so usually kind of along the, at the same time people are building the equipment models, someone else is building the pipe specs and making sure that those work inside the product so you can actually have piping content to put in your mm -hmm. model. Um, and usually you also have someone, if you have a third party doing your structural steel, or if you have them in-house, and they're also kind of co-developing that along the same time too. Okay. And then Civil has already done the work and is usually in and out of there before all this has started. Yeah. So you have some sort of grade or location to put your building in. So you, you kind of figure out, you get those pieces, put three pieces going. Um, and then one of the other co important considerations is how are you going to locate everything? So regardless of whether we're using Revit or AutoCAD or Civil 3D or Plant 3D, we need to make sure that all the buildings show up at the same spot, mm -hmm. right? Because if we start modeling stuff in different spots and we pull all together, you have like one building's piping is over here, the other building's is in a completely the wrong spot. And, right. Yeah, and so this. you have to coordinate, have a single coordination point that all the softwares are working off of in a project base point. Mm -hmm. um, and then in some cases you need to rotate that a little bit so that you have your drawings are all 90 or zero degree, zero degrees or 90. Um, and so you want to nail that down early in the process. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're going to go back and fix all that stuff when you figure out that the building is not in the right spot. Right. Um, so once you got your model set up, you have your PNIDs, you have your equipment done, your pipe specs, then you're ready to start piping. So usually the process is someone sits down with your PNIDs. They have two monitors, hopefully, maybe three if they're lucky. Yeah. Um, the PNID up there, uh, they usually have a highlighter two of some sort, they have the plant 3D or something open and mm -hmm. they usually have Navisworks open. And so what they'll do is they'll look for a gap, Navisworks figure out where they want to pipe, or out the pipe, they'll put uh -huh. the pipe racks in and then they'll figure out where they want to go and locate the equipment and then start routing the pipe. Yeah, so, nice. Then after that, they, get, they do some checks. So make sure we're not running into walls, buildings, equipment, steel, other pipe, that type of thing. Review it in Navisworks, run an isometric, which is a document that tells the people how to construct the pipe uh -huh. and build that school. And then they'll usually kind of say, okay, this one's done, and then go on the next line. Yeah. So nice. Then rinse and repeat for the next thousand times. There you go. <laughs> nice. Well, you get good at it after a yeah. thousand times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, can you uh, speak to the implementation and the training time that would be required to roll yeah. out Plan 3D workflow? Yeah. So, um, Usually we, we do cover like, a, if they're looking at the PNID portion, we'll teach that in about a day. Okay. Um, if they're doing the 3D part, we'll usually do that in three days. So if they're gonna do all of it together, we usually block out four days. Gotcha. Um, and that's like for an instructor, you know, working full day, right? We do wow. have some live lab offerings that we split it up across half days, um, but it's roughly the same amount of time. So the goal there is to get people hands on time <clears throat> into the software doing exercises. So what we focus on in the basic user training is making sure that they have um, experiencing the breadth of what the, the software can do. Because mm -hmm. sometimes for some of these scenarios, um, like if they're doing skid design, they might not ever touch certain parts of the software, right? Mm -hmm. But if they have exposure to all of it, then they can kind of figure out where they want to go and what they want to do with it. Gotcha. Whereas if they only see this narrow slice, then they'll never be aware of what it could do. Um, so our goal is to get them hands on time using as many of the features as we can. Um, we have sample exercises that they walk through. It's a very structured class. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of times people ask, well, can you, we use our own content, we want to do our own project. The, yeah. the downside of that is <clears throat> we don't know what you do. We don't know if your model's already screwed up or if it's great or anything like that. So. Right. Um, we would have to go through a validation process of figuring out, you know, what we would want to do inside your model. And to do that, it just adds time and cost, right? So sure. this is the most cost-effective way to get up to speed faster mm -hmm. and, and get people familiar with the software. And then a lot of times, um, it kind of depends on the level of experience. And, you know, if they've been doing piping design for a long time, they don't need a lot of hand-holding or help mm -hmm. with the configuration. Sometimes they do. Um, there's a lot of pieces that are new compared to other programs. So, um, we have a typical, typically a three-day admin class on how to configure your title blocks, your drawing properties, because like we were mentioning with reports, they're very flexible. Mm -hmm. So showing how to set those up, how to configure the labels that go into the drawings, mm -hmm. um, how to do your pipe specs and catalogs. So that's a, we'd spend a day on that and then 
the last day is uh, we would cover like the isometric configuration and then reports. Gotcha. Okay. And so it's pretty intense. Usually by the time of that, everyone's head's hurting sure. you know, at the end of every day. Like, oh my word, like, information. No more, no more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's even at that, you know, it's three days and that sounds like a long time, but it's still barely scratching the surface of what it can do. And so mm. um, we usually spend, you know, I like to have some sort of follow up over the next few weeks after people adopt it, mm-hmm. maybe like schedule one or two follow up calls in an hour, say, do you have any questions? And just make sure that they're keeping on with the the work and adopting it well. Mm-hmm. Nice, very so. cool. Well, I got one more question for you. It's the, yeah. the kind of the future projects that you're working on, but in order for people to hear your answer to that, they got to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, so David, uh, what kind of future projects are you working on rolling out for Plan 3D? And, <laughs> I'd uh, love to hear yes. all the, the goods there. Yeah, so this is uh, maybe one of my best ideas ever. So <laughs> nice. I, well, you've had a lot of good ideas, so that's... <laughs> I really love this idea. Um, so one of the hurdles about being a reseller and just the, the whole thing in general. So, well, thanks for taking the time to oh, yeah. come uh, join the show and talk about that exciting yeah. project and yeah. Plan 3D. That's fun. Appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to the show. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, reach out to our sponsors, Applied Software at ASTI.com and let them know we sent you. And listen anytime by simply going to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out our website, bridgingthegappod.com. Until next time, I'm Todd Wyant, thanking you for joining us on the Bridging the Gap podcast, sponsored by Applied Software. Keep innovating.